<laughs> we're, we're getting ready to get started. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm David Levy, Dean of the Duke Law School. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Ben Heinemann with us here today. He's had a, a brilliant legal career. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He clerked for Justice Potter Stewart on the Supreme Court. Uh, he's been involved in lots of different areas of practice, all um, with great success and brilliance. Most, most recently, and for 18 years, he was the Chief Legal Officer at the General Electric Company. He's now associated with uh, Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School um, as a fellow. And he will be speaking to us today on the lawyer's duty of leadership, it's something that we consider to be very important here at Duke Law School. Uh, ben. <laughs> uh, thank you, David, for being short. Um, it is a signal honor and privilege to be here at this great law school as it begins a new chapter in its illustrious history under Dean Levy. That phrase slips easily off my lips because when I was a young boy in Chicago, Dean Levy, first name Edward, was my father's best friend and I saw him often when he and his wonderful wife Kate came to dinner at our house. But that is a story for another time. More than 10 years ago, Tony Cronman broadened discussion of the legal profession by a back to the future revival of the lawyer statesman ideal, a concept with its origins in the 19th century. These remarks take his thoughtful analysis as a starting point to stimulate again a discussion about the leadership role lawyers can and should play. But while sharing his intent, I disagree with some of his key points and in particular am far more optimistic about the future. My thesis is that law school graduates should aspire not just to be wise counselors, but wise leaders. Not just to dispense practical wisdom, but to be practical visionaries. Not just to have positions where they advise, but where they decide. I wish to redefine, or at least re-emphasize, the concept of lawyer explicitly to include lawyer as leader. I do this with the hope that the law schools and the profession will more candidly recognize the importance of leadership and will more directly prepare and inspire young lawyers to seek roles of ultimate responsibility and accountability than is the case today. These are roles which those with core legal training have in fact assumed throughout our history and which Alexis de Tocqueville recognized and celebrated more than 150 years ago. Why do I advance this thesis? First, our society, national and global, suffers from a leadership deficit. We need our brightest, toughest, most ethical, most broad gauge to combine strong, substantive visions with an ability to get things done. Surely our law school graduates can try, and I emphasize try, to address that deficit if they are so motivated. The core competencies of law are as good a foundation for broad leadership as other training. This is not to say that the best and brightest are entitled to lead, nor that they will succeed if they do. That cozy assumption has been born and has died many times, certainly was when I was a student in a tragic war in Southeast Asia. But it is to say that those who are blessed should attempt the difficult, perhaps Sisyphean task of leadership, but with humility about the time, effort, and discipline required and about the difficulty and contingency of affecting important change. A second reason for the thesis. The legal profession, by many accounts, is suffering from a crisis of morale that, as Dean Cronman has put it, is the product, quote, of growing doubts about the capacity of a lawyer's life to offer fulfillment. An important dimension of this problem is the disconnect between personal values and professional life, especially the possible amorality of serving clients' interests in an adversary mode. Providing leadership can certainly be an affirmative and a testing of one's vision and one's values. So providing leadership may serve both social and individual needs. Third, other cognate professional schools, business and public policy, have as their explicit mission the training of students to lead in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Surely the products of our law schools who are at least as talented, should also aspire to lead in these spheres, not just grow up to provide advice to today's peers who will be tomorrow's decision makers in business and government. 
But today, law schools and professional associations may not have a broad vision of lawyers as leaders, indeed may be ambivalent about that role. It is a small point, perhaps, but a telling one, that my law school, Yale's website, does not include any statement of mission, not even do justice or equal justice under the law. And one can read the recent speeches of the distinguished presidents of the American Association of Law Schools, as I have done, and find barely a word on lawyers as leaders. Duke's blueprint is a notable and elegant exception. My view of leadership is capacious. Leadership can occur in strictly legal institutions, the bench, the bar, and law schools, or in social, political, and economic organizations. It can occur in the public sector, or the private sector, or the nonprofit sector. It can occur in traditional institutions, or new institutions created by leaders. It can lie in finding solutions for an existing agenda, or defining a whole new agenda. It can be as a specialist or as a generalist. It can be in policy or in politics. It can be in US institutions or global ones. It can be as an insider, using power for good ends, but with inevitable compromises. Or it can be as an outsider, speaking truth to power without the responsibility of institutional authority. It can be as a person of action or as a person of the mind, whose ideas seek ultimately to affect action. And leadership can have many styles and effects. Command and control, collegial, managerial, exemplary, charismatic, strategic, or transformational. Whatever the setting and whatever the style, the lawyer as leader is focused on making decisions for institutions or causes or ideas that engage the whole person and that have as a driving force the desire to make our national or global society a quote unquote better place, however difficult that goal is to define, much less achieve. But I have not abandoned the temple. My aspiration for lawyers as leaders does build on basic legal training and modes of thinking, on core legal competencies. And importantly, it certainly contemplates the historic roles of astute lawyer and wise counselor as having high value in and of themselves and as stations on the way to leadership. Building on these introductory per perspectives, I want to address four issues. What are the qualities of mind of a great lawyer who can become a great leader? Why is a life of value so important to a life in the law? And how may values be realized most vividly as decision maker, not as counselor? How can we widen the field of view about career beginnings and endings for people who have legal training, especially in an era of globalization? And lastly, what are the implications for law students and for law schools? Let me first talk about quality of mind. We can all agree on the value of boot camp. Well, maybe you can't, but when you've been out a little bit, you can. Uh, we can all agree on the value of boot camp, of basic training in legal subjects and concepts. It is no accident that more than 100 years after Christopher Columbus Langdale, and more than 50 years after the realists, the first year curriculum at most law school is still built on four traditional subjects of torts, contracts, con law, and procedure, and perhaps property and criminal law. These courses still use uh, primarily uh, appellate opinions to elucidate issue spotting, legal concepts, legal reasoning, legal ambiguity, and the importance and elusiveness of facts, to list just some of the obvious lessons learned. However narrow, the analytic reasoning from the case method is at the core of what makes us a profession, and what is drilled into us, perhaps to the point of ennui, during the second and third years of law school as well. These are the scales. As Dean Larry Kramer of Stanford has said, you can't play the piano, much less compose a piece, until you learn them. The question at the dawn of the 21st century is this. What other qualities of mind, what other modes of thinking do we want in our lawyers, counselors, leaders? Some of these qualities of mind, especially the first I mentioned, reflect changes in thinking about law that occurred in the first third of the 20th century, such as exploring law in action, or uncovering and reasoning about the policy frameworks and value choices which surround the structure of rules. But some of these modes of thinking may not seem like traditional legal qualities of mind at all, even as revised and restated in a post-realist world. Nonetheless, if we want legal professionals to be not just astute lawyers, but wise counselors and potentially leaders, then they are an important and interrelated list of complementary competencies that should be closely associated with core legal competencies to provide a form of necessary professional general education. At least, the students, at least for students who want a professional degree to serve as a rail pass to many destinations rather than a ticket to a particular specialty or subspecialty. 
These qualities of minds are not without historical antecedents when we reflect on individuals with legal training who became leaders. Nor as modes of thinking are they simply the traits of character and temperament that Dean Crommon argues were at the core of his concept of a lawyer statement. Those character and temperamental traits such as civic mindedness, deliberation, experience, prudence, sympathy, detachment, and practical wisdom, important as those traits may be. Most generally, we are seeking lawyers who have a creative and constructive, not just a critical cast of mind, who relish asking ought, not just answering is questions. How do we, how can we build, not just deconstruct, an argument in a brief, a regulation, a complex piece of legislation, a business plan, the agenda of an NGO, a foreign policy, a cross-border strategy for global issues like energy and the environment. We are seeking lawyers who, in asking what ought we to do, can articulate par powerfully a set of systematic and constructive options that expose and explore the value tensions inherent in most decisions. Two fundamental examples. In the legislative context, what are the options as we try to balance equity and efficiency in business regulation? Or in healthcare reform, how do we optimize low cost, high quality, and greater access? In the business context, when issues often come clothed in shades of gray, what are the alternatives for accomplishing a legitimate business goal with differing degrees of legal, ethical, and reputational risk and varying direct and indirect costs? We are seeking lawyers who, in addition to exposing value tensions, can find a fair balance in the ultimate course taken between legitimate competing values. A balance between the policy or risk cost choices I've just mentioned, or on a grander scale, a balance between the values that underlie so much of American history, legal and otherwise. Between freedom and equality, order and liberty, community and individualism, protection of private goods and advancement of social goods, cultural pluralism and national citizenship. If we are not totally cloistered, we have to make choices in our professional lives. Those decisions are better informed with a sure grasp of legitimate values and tension and more durable with a fair balance of those values. We are seeking lawyers who think about the ethical reputation and enlightened self-interest of their client or the institution they are leading, not just what is strictly legal or advantageous in the short term. In case anyone has not read the papers for the past five years, a narrow view that it is legal isn't always the right answer. Exposing and reasoning about these highly relevant extra-legal issues is a critical function for lawyers. We are seeking lawyers who, in making recommendations or decisions, are capable of assessing all dimensions of risk, but who are not risk-averse. Taking chances is not a quality of mind customarily associated with lawyers, but is often vital to innovation and change in the public and private sectors. We, have the, we are seeking lawyers who have the ability to understand how to make rules realities. Lawyers who understand institutions, history, culture, resources, and psychology, and who can identify and develop strategies to mitigate the obstacles to meaningful implementation. We are seeking lawyers who understand and respect the hurly-burly world of politics, media, and power, not just the more intellectual world of policy prescriptions and legal rule structures. Whatever the institution or process, whether judicial, legislative, or executive, whether public or private, politics underlies the creation and implementation of rules or policies. In a democratic society, politics legitimizes the public decisions directly or indirectly. But among many professionals, there is a general distaste for that current bizarre amalgam of money, television, polling, focus groups, and candidate phoniness that noted political writer Joel Klein describes in his terrific book, Politics Lost. We are seeking lawyers who not, are not just strong individual contributors, but who have the ability to work cooperatively and constructively on teams, whether the innumerable and inevitable interagency task force of government, or the cross-functional teams inside a large company, or the cross-border multifunctional teams of a difficult global transaction, or hard-edged effective teams of multi-state or test case litigation, or the culturally sensitive teams in multilateral international organizations. We are seeking lawyers who are not just strong team members, but who can build and lead organizations, 
create the vision, the values, the priorities, the strategies, the people, the systems, the processes, the checks and balances, the resources, and the motivation. Working on teams and leading them are, in connect, are interconnected. Much of leadership today is not command and control of the troops, but persuasion, motivation, and empowerment of teams around a shared vision. We are seeking lawyers who in developing positions, whether in an article, a brief, a regulation, legislation, code of corporate conduct, or myriad other rule announcing activities, have the ability to understand the value and limits of related disciplines, including economics, anthropology, history, political science, psychology, statistics, sociology, and organizational theory, to increase the accuracy and sophistication of those positions. Lawyers cannot all have joint degrees, but they need the aptitude and capacity to envision the relevance and then through the expertise of others mine these other fields of knowledge to understand strengths and the limitations inherent in their assumptions and methods. We are seeking lawyers who understand the methods of thinking and analysis taught in the business and public policy schools. Law, public policy, and business are inseparable perspectives on most problems. Today's professionals from whatever school they receive their formal degree should have more than a passing familiarity with intellectual angles of attack taught at the other two professional schools, or better yet, have joint degree. We are seeking lawyers who have global understanding, intuition, and perspective, a subject which I will discuss in a moment. We are seeking lawyers who can perform early in their career as outstanding specialists so that they truly understand what analytic rigor and excellence are, but can then have the vision, breadth, and inclination to be outstanding generalist leaders later in life. The quintessential quality of the great generalist is envisioning and understanding the multiple dimensions of issues to define the problem or issue properly, and the ability to comprehensively integrate those dimensions into the decision. A great public leader must integrate policy and politics. A great business leader must integrate the multiple internal disciplines, finance, human resources, law, engineering, marketing, sales, technology, with outside perspectives, those of customers, investors, regulators, and the community. By now, you are surely thinking, some of these qualities of mind may be too far removed from lawyering or too difficult to attain. One short response would be to look at generations of lawyers who are instrumental in changing the face of American law and American institutions. The founders who are extraordinary men of learning, ideas, and action on a grand scale. The abolitionists, anti-slavery officials, and authors of the post-Civil War amendments who sought to remove the cancer of slavery embedded in the Constitution and customs of a young nation. The progressives who accelerated the march to a mixed economy. The realist New Dealers who were protean in their intellectual interests and their careers. Those in the 1940s who were present at the creation of the Soviet Union containment strategy. And those who were leaders of the civil rights revolution in the 1950s and 1960s, not just on the streets, but, in petition, but petitioning or participating in all three branches of government. Broad, normative, multi-dimensional views of society not just preoccupation with narrow rules or minor legal change, informed those generations, even though grand change sometimes had to occur, occur step by step. Let me talk now for a moment about values. Simply stated, professional satisfaction comes when you, who you are and what you do have a strong correlation. When people leave work at the end of the day, do they have a distaste for, distaste for and distance from what they did or do they believe that it re reflects their sense of identity? A sense of self comes from spheres of life outside of work, family, friends, religion, community. But many who select law as a career do so because they want to express their core values in their work. They do not set out to be Melville's Bartleby, Bartleby the Scrivener. In the contemporary profession, the disconnect between what you do and who you are exists for many. In accepting an award at a public interest dinner in 2006, Dean Bartlett of this law school described a number of disturbing trends. <clears throat> Quote, lawyers, according to a Johns Hopkins study, are 3.6 times more likely to be depressed than the average among 105 occupational groups. Only 29% of lawyers in an ABA study reported that they were very satisfied professionally. Work by Lawrence Krieger indicates that law school Law students enter law school emotionally as healthy as other graduates and professional students, but become disproportionately less happy, less satisfied, less stable, and more depressed, apparently because the dissonance between the internal value systems students bring to the law 
and the external cues embedded in their education and their profession. This is the dean of Duke Law School. That's not me. End of quote. Cronman <laughs> argues that the crisis of morale in the profession stems from, quote, a growing sense among lawyers generally that the yearning to be engaged in some lifelong endeavor that has value in its own right can no longer be satisfied in their professional work. <coughs> to be sure, other commentators and studies might pay it a less grim picture of the profession. But many would argue that the congruence between personal values and professional actions is vital to professional satisfaction and worthy of personal and academic reflection. This congruence can take many forms. For those whose fundamental value is wealth, a lucrative law practice may suffice. For those who enjoy combat, being a successful litigator may suffice. For those who enjoy technical mastery, being a highly successful specialist or subspecialist in one of the law's many domains may suffice. Beyond that, lawyers may find that the task of serving clients, regardless of the client's issues, advances a conception of justice and that such a conception of service may suffice. Further still, there are cause lawyers whose identification lies with clients' issues or their status. And that may suffice. For example, civil rights, civil liberties, human rights, reproductive rights, gender equality, environmental protection, representing the unrepresented. My point is not to judge these different convergences of values and professional action. Indeed, in an era when people will change jobs with some frequency, so may they emphasize different personal values at different times and find that different roles provide different professional satisfaction. Nor do I intend to diminish the fundamental legal role of providing services to the institutions and, inst and individuals who need it. Nor do I say that the lawyer's personal values are superior to the values of individuals in need of legal services. My point instead is that a life of values is central prof to professional satisfaction, and that one way to live such a life is to be the client, not just serve the client to set the course as leaders and practical visionaries, not just to provide advice and practical wisdom about, that, about what that course might be. Deep personal engagement, the deep expression of one's self and one's value, can come from the ultimate responsibility and accountability for an institution or organization or school of thought that matters. In my professional experience, which began long ago in 1971, there was no more uh, engaging convergence of who you are and what you do than having leadership, responsibility, and accountability. Serving as a leader, not just a counselor, in big government, big law, and big business has been enormously challenging. For example, at GE, I tried to determine the best way to conduct business with integrity in China, a society bursting with opportunity, but rife with corruption, conflicts of interest, and the autocratic rule of men, not law. When business and society issues were at the fore, I sought to define corporate citizenship and to make decisions about what ethical steps a company should take beyond what was required by the spirit and letter of compliance with formal financial and legal rules. For most of my career, I have been extremely fortunate. I have been able to meet my test of life that I like to get up in the morning. Um, and this was especially true when I had the good luck and great privilege of trying, of trying to lead important institutions. Let me turn for a moment now to careers. To utilize the qualities of mind I have discussed and to create the full range of opportunities to live a professional life of values, it is necessary to broaden our conception of what constitutes a career for a person with a legal career. If we look at the issue from a purely descriptive perspective, this is already happening. Professionals now entering the workplace are not likely to be lifers, spending their life with Cravath or GM or the Foreign Service or the ACLU. Many professionals will have many different careers. That common sense observation is borne out by the after the JD study of 4,000 graduates from the class of 2000, which found that excluding clerkships, more than a third of the graduates had changed jobs within three years out, and 18% had, had already changed twice. Other studies show that graduates who are out of law school longer have changed jobs more often and migrated into less traditional legal positions. There is a value in changing jobs. Such a job involves taking risks, learning new organizations, adapting to new cultures, and most importantly, developing different perspectives on problems because of different institutional roles. For example, odd as it may seem, 
I was a better general counsel of a huge multinational corporation because I had been a public interest lawyer vindicating the rights of the mentally handicapped at the outset of my career, and then an assistant secretary for policy at the Federal Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. If we accept not just the fact of, but also the value of a law graduates having multiple careers, then we should also broaden, or perhaps reiterate, the view of possibilities to include at least the following ideas. A much broader view of governmental jobs, in addition to the offices of the attorney generals, the attorney generals, the US attorneys, the district attorneys, the legal advisors, there are many other federal, state, and local positions which law graduates may occupy. For example, policy or operational jobs in other executive branch departments or agencies such as Treasury, State, Defense, the FCC, the FDA, the EPA, or in the offices of governors and mayors in their respective cabinet departments. In addition, key legislative committee staff, either in the Congress or state legislatures, are positions of potentially great importance and influence, but are generally ignored or disparaged by graduates of elite law schools. Secondly, a career in politics. Many law school grads, graduates bemoan the state of our polity at endless dinner parties in countless professional or academic centers. But starting at the bottom in politics, as local selectmen, state representative or state senator is still the place where people must serve if they are to become the mayors, governors, and senators who play such an important role in our political culture. Jobs in multilateral institutions. Such organizations have a broad array of goals, from general purpose like the UN or the OECD, to finance and development like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the Export-Import Bank, or the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, to security and law, NATO, Interpol, the World Court, and to others with specialized objectives like the World Health Organization. Jobs in nonprofit organizations that are not strictly legal. There are many such entities beyond public interest law firms addressing major issues like human rights, education, privacy, poverty, health, environment, corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, cultural development, but all with need for core competencies in assessment of rules, issues, and the operation of institutions. Jobs in the private sector that are not just legal jobs. These include business development, coordinating executives in foreign nations, governmental policy and government relations positions, and ultimately core profit and loss leadership in large public firms or small entrepreneurial ones. We should broaden our view to consider both the traditional and non-traditional legal positions in the context of, the pr of pressing global issues. In my stu uh, student era, we were moved deeply and influenced profoundly by the American rights revolution. Today, law graduates are seeking careers in an era of revolutionary change in global trends, issues, <clears throat> relationships, and institutions. Let me illustrate with just a few examples. First, how do we meet the challenges of global security? Terrorist groups, state sponsors of terrorism, threats of nuclear, chemical, biological, and cyber weapons, evolving relationships between developed and developing powers, multilateral security institutions and alliances, US weapons, resources, and institutions, homeland security, and public diplomacy and the perception of US power and policy. Second, how do we address the issues of an integrating global economy, the world trade agenda, regional economic integration and development in North America, the EU, the ASEAN countries in Africa, competition, competition and integration between regions and nations, EU, US, US, China, US, India, China, India. The convergence or harmonization of international commercial law, tax, antitrust, privacy, labor, direct investment. The role and resources of multilateral financing and development agencies and economic development in failed, failing, fragile, and rising nations. Third is a companion of economic development and integration. How can we build institutional infrastructure at the nation state or international level to deal with critical, critical global issues and trends, state building in less developed nations to create durable, transparent, and accountable economic, social, political, and legal institutions, human rights, discrimination against women and exploitation of children, demographic change, both population growth and loss, aging, urbanization, migration, energy and environment, shortages of food and water, corruption and other international crime, drugs, piracy, human trafficking, poverty, health and education, religious and ethnic conflict, and transforming developments in technology, including information technology. Fourth, how do we manage private transnational economic entities, now as powerful as many nations, to attain high performance with high integrity, to advance important and legitimate private interests, but also to act in the public interest? All these pressing issues are about policies, laws, rules, and institutions in national, regional, or global society with complex public-private dimensions, myriad interdisciplinary considerations, with a self-evident need for leadership on policy, politics, and implementation administration. 
Someone will have to provide the vision, the wisdom, and the energy to lead. No one is totally suited for such tasks, but no one is better suited than a lawyer with broad training and experience. Properly, def and, properly and broadly defined, the lawyer's core skills of understanding how values, rules, and institutions interrelate with social, economic, and polit con political conditions is central to the demands of contemporary leadership. Many of the roles I have suggested provide great opportunities to learn about the complex set of, inter set of interactions and to prepare for possible assumption of leadership responsibility. We need heroes and heroines for these broader careers, not just from the past, but also from the present. From the present. Students need to understand how those with law degrees became social entrepreneurs, founders of public interest law firms, heads of important non-governmental advocacy institutions, forceful social critics, leaders of transnational corporations, venture capitalists, respected executives in multilateral public institutions, leaders of financial services firms, head of, of foundations, and presidents of universities, as well as presidents of the United States and Supreme Court justices. This, this, this career discussion must at least note the ever-present student concern about money, which, like sex in the Victorian era, era um, may not always be discussed candidly, although I was just with a bunch of students this morning and they discussed it very candidly. <laughs> um, law school programs to defer or forgive loans for those who go into public service or take lower paying jobs need to expand to cover more students more meaningfully. Those that do exist give young lawyers early career choices beyond the often stultifying life of being an hours driven associate in a large firm. These early career alternatives often provide more responsibility and more experience than the associate's existence. Moreover, diversity and variation of careers allows graduates to spend part of their professional lives in settings where they can develop net worth while still devoting other parts of their careers to public service. The basic point is that those who excel at Duke can take career risks. They will be sought after not just tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. Excellence in law school gives them a, a, a ticket for a successful trip across multiple careers if they are blessed with character and motivation. Finally, what is the implications of all this for law students and law schools? Some readers might argue that my per perspective takes us beyond, maybe far beyond, the bounds of lawyering and has few implications for legal education. The quality of law students has never been higher. Law schools, of course, have offerings beyond those centered on cases. Courses analyzing uh, policy, providing clinical experience, exploring the relationship between law and other disciplines. Almost regardless of what is taught in law school, students of this generation, like students of my generation, will find their own way. And, it was, and when it is their generation's time, they too will assume positions of leadership. Without being an expert on legal education, and while admiring much that law schools have to offer, let me disagree with that complacent position. I believe law schools should do much more and in light of my professional experience and the posts, points outlined above, let me ask at least some questions and offer some thoughts on the following topics to give that belief that law schools should do much more, some texture and context. First cases. Should law schools develop complex interdisciplinary cases akin to those used in business and public policy schools to illuminate the multiple uh, uh, dimensions of issues and processes, the inherent dilemmas and choices and decision and the constraints malleable and rigid. These cases would have the richness of an institutional role, institutional setting, and particular historic moment. Factors relevant to decision or action or more. They would be more open texture than appellate cases, and they would put uh, students in different legal and leadership roles than the appellate judge. The subjects are almost infinite. They might focus on the chairman of the Judiciary Committee deciding how to run a Supreme Court confirmation hearing. The Assistant Secretary for Human Rights at the State Department seeking to make his or her concerns more central to the department or the administration's action. The general counsel of a multinational company trying to develop a strategy for doing business with integrity in China. The issues presented in such cases can range from the highest questions of theory to the most practical but very important questions of implementation. Can there be more emphasis on creating rather than critiquing? Everybody gets to be really good at critiquing things at law school. But can students be asked to write more opinions, regulations, legislation, memorandum of understanding, basic deal documents, IRS opinion letters, policy and dangers for key agencies, plans for environmental NGOs, and the like? Requiring creation of positive work product 
in a, is a powerful way to require students to think about what intellectual disciplines and perspectives are necessary to solve problems. How can the proposal fit reality to the extent possible? How can it appeal to appropriate constituencies and become a governing norm? And how can it be implemented? <laughs> Secondly, relations with other department schools, joint degrees. Is there enough true team teaching with colleagues in other professional schools, like business and public policy, or other departments, like history, economics, political science, psychology, and anthropology, where professors could engage and argue and illuminate together in real time the different perspectives which most important issues, uh, with which must, most uh, issues must be viewed. I was recently at Stanford, and there's a new trade course taught by a lawyer, an economist, and a political scientist. All together, they teach it for a semester, and they all participate uh, in every class. Is it possible to work with the university's business school to develop a truly integrated JD MBA degree, rather than giving a fractured joint degree if the student has just taken enough uh, courses in each school? Do current scholarship and tenure standard standards make it hard, if not impossible, for law or business school professors to break out of their silos and cooperate closely with professors and cognate professional schools or joint degree programs? How can those barriers be broken down? The Yale, law, uh, Yale School of Management rewrote its curriculum to focus on the integration of traditional business disciplines, marketing, corporate finance, sales, technology development, in a systematic approach to key external and internal business processes instead, employee relations, sourcing and managing funds, the customer, state, and society. These interdisciplinary courses in a business school context proceed from the premise that leadership is about the integration of different perspectives that apply to the same problem. As a statement from SOM on its reform puts it, in the last 30 years, and I do believe this has applicability, obviously, to law schools, in the last 30 years, while the management profession has changed significantly, the profession has changed significantly, management education has not. Today, managerial careers cross the boundaries of function, organization, and industry, as well as cultural and political borders. Even managers in large organizations must be entrepreneurial in the, entrepreneurial in the sense that their success depends on their ability to synthesize disparate information, analyze competing functional priorities, and draw together and coordinate resources and individuals in a context that is often fluid and decentralized. These courses are, st are structured to accommodate easily a legal policy or ethical dimension. And if it followed, it, other business schools are excellent vehicles for collaborative uh, interaction between law and business schools to broaden professional education for students at both. The importance of these joint efforts is in question, in my view. As a Financial uh, Times article recently noted about the international public sector, the next generation of public sector employees in, in the international arena uh, is going to be more business savvy. Growing numbers of staff at multilateral institutions, government uh, departments, and NGOs are going back to school, to business school. A similar, similar need also exists for a truly integrated uh, JD master's in public policy or master's in public uh, administration degrees. Most controversial of all, why shouldn't it be possible to get a JD MBA, a JD MPP, or a JD MA in other disciplines in three years with truly integrated programs? Without launching yet another attack on the second and third year of law school, I submit that talented students at many law schools could in that time frame handle the challenge of acquiring the necessary disciplines inherent in the different approaches in the different professional schools or departments. I will not attempt to address possible concerns of the Association of American Law Schools or state bar examiners, but I surmise that if there was law school will, this problem could be resolved. The bar exam would still stand as a toll gate to the license to practice if that is the direction a joint degree holder chooses to go. Such reform could make three years of professional school constantly exciting and challenging. Third, in terms of the law school's activities, globalization. Are the current courses on international law addressing the most important globalization issues? I believe that every matter on the global issues I listed above, from global security to global economic integration to global institution building, are fit subjects, indeed vital subjects, worthy of law school attention. To take one example, because it is some combination of economic development and state building, what could be more important than sustained, multifaceted attention to the broad issues of development in those failed, failing, fragile, and rising nations which have so much of the world's population and potential and are homes to so many of its problems. It need hardly be said that these global courses properly conceived are the perfect venues for interdisciplinary integration and team teaching with professors from other professional schools and departments. Can we make the law school experience more international? Is it possible for law students to, re law students to receive credit for a semester abroad just as they could do in college if they have the requisite language skills? 
What a fantastic experience it would be if you could go for a semester to Tsinghua or Oxford or Heidelberg. Is it possible that law students and faculty could travel up together abroad for a winter session or for part of a semester? Fourth, careers. Are law school faculties and career development offices generating a broad enough range of summer and entry-level job opportunities, not just in the US, but across the globe, in non-traditional settings like NGOs or multilateral institutions, or in private sector or legislative institutions or executive, executive branch positions beyond the strictly legal? Does it make sense to have courses and studies on career issues in the legal profession? The program on the legal profession at Harvard Law School, with which I am associated, is seeking to address some of these issues. Importantly, to provide inspiration for students about possibilities, why not a course on the careers, intellectual history, and pragmatic approaches of those with legal training who have had a striking impact on public and private institutions in our society? My her Heroes and Heroines course. Fifth, institutions. Because career diversity involves institutional diversity, would it make sense to have organizational theory and behavior be part of the law school course offerings? A related issue is the internal governance of institutions. This subject should be at the center of a lawyer's interest and potential expertise. It need hardly be said that governance failings are today the source of today's, many of today's scandals and dysfunctional organizations. Similarly, would it make sense to teach about leadership styles? There is a robust literature arising out of real situations. situations. Leaders and their styles matter, at least in every institution I've been involved in. Sixth, a direct connect to the profession. Perhaps it has always been true, but the world is changing at a breathtaking pace. And those of us in the world of practice are often facing new issues of law, policy, and ethics, and for better or worse, breaking new ground. Should the law schools systematically evaluate and increase their interaction with those outside the academy to the enrichment of both? Certainly one time-honored way is to have people from the world of practice be guest lecturers in courses. I cannot say how much of it is done today. I can probably say it should be done much more. Another time-honored way is to have leading practitioners as adjunct professors. Many law schools are close to great centers of law practice and can draw on top lawyers. Again, the question is probably not whether law schools do this, but whether they do it enough. One solution, of course, is to have courses co-taught by a professor and a distinguished practitioner. Would it make sense, with respect to many legal subjects, to periodically hold roundtables with key practitioners to discuss trends, problems, politics, and issues, to set a research agenda uh, for the law schools. And what is the view of law faculties of the profession and the practice of law? A, a pretty important question. There is a liter literature from within the law schools themselves decrying the increasing distance between the professoriate and the profession, between the legal scholarship which is rewarded by tenure and the teaching of students who will go out into the professional world. More than 20 years ago, a prominent dean, Harry Wellington of Yale, expressed concern that professors viewed the profession as Philistines and that the gap between the two cultures was ever widening. Is this statement true today or is the situation deteriorated? Lastly, methods of change. What processes of change are appropriate for successful and tenured faculties with fierce pride in their intellectual autonomy? Is it just up to internet? In, in, individual professors to address questions of broader cases, professional school integration, globalization, or is there a broader, if consensual, institutional approach that can continually rethink the mission of law schools and go in new directions through self-direction of existing faculty or through new hires? Are old professors, successful in their ways, prepared to allow a new generation to define law school attainment in different ways? The issue of how to reconcile the demands of scholarship with the demands of teaching and how institutional change should occur is, as you know, being debated in many centers of higher education and right now at Duke. Let me end with a discussion of the vision of general professional education. Most sweepingly, can or should law schools continue to teach the core legal competencies but be more explicit about the range of careers that lawyers may have and more systematic about the range of complementary competencies that are important for such career uh, uh, variation, the kinds of qualities of mind that I discussed at the beginning of this talk. Should law schools pioneer in developing a concept of general professional education, a major in basic legal education, but with minors in, in business and public policy or other disciplines, um, to serve those who will be astute practitioners, wise counselors, and then actors in non-legal positions and ultimately as, as leaders. How one defines problems has a controlling impact on how one addresses them. 
I have sought to argue that law school grad graduates should define problems broadly and define their roles broadly, ultimately as leaders with accountability and responsibility. This is an issue for individuals, for law schools, and for the profession. It requires a change in how we think about being a lawyer and how we train people for careers following professional education. But the vision is soundly rooted in our history. Regardless of legal education or their profession's pronouncements, lawyers have played a variety of leadership roles in the past, and if we survey the landscape, continue to do so today. As this essay does, Tony Cronman sought to stimulate debate in the profession of law schools about law and leadership. I admire his careful, thoughtful, and original views, but there are many differences between our positions. His valued leadership traits do not go far enough toward the broader qualities of mind or modes of thinking that I believe leaders must possess. He emphasizes the lawyer's skill in careful case-by-case -case development of law. I believe that lawmaking, indeed the making of many types of rules governing behavior in many types of institution, must be viewed in its many forms, including the lawyer's creative role in establishing broad, comprehensive policy framework within which interstitial rules develop. Although he starts his book with a brief nod to the historical fact of lawyers as political leaders, his dominant recommendation at the end is about wise counseling, not accountable leadership. He spends much of his time critiquing private firms, the courts, and the academy, and spends little time on the vast array of institutions and, operation and, uh, and opportunities where leadership is possible from legislative and executive positions to corporations to NGOs to global institution. Perhaps the biggest difference is that Cronman is a pessimist. Quote, I have reached a gloomy conclusion. I do not think the ideal of lawyer statesmen can be re revived, at least at an institutional level. Um, in deference to, but in disagreement with Cronman's thought-provoking book, I was tempted to call this talk The Found Lawyer. His book is called The Lost Lawyer. I am optimistic. I believe in an individual's moral agency. I believe that institutions can be changed or important new ones created. I believe that today's issues are so vast and so challenging that it is a wonderful time to be blessed with legal training and to go out and take on the enormous challenges of a difficult world. With ambition tempered by humility at the complexity, difficulty, discipline, and self-sacrifice inherent in the task. If law firms are huge money machines, change them or start smaller firms that are real partnerships of like-minded lawyers who care more about the quality of practice than money, or create and lead an NGO, or go head a corporate law department, or a corporation itself, or plan a life in public service, including elective politics, or be a true citizen of the world in a multilateral institution, or be a powerful voice of social criticism. Most importantly, take on the big issues of the contemporary world, or redefine what the big issues are. It is all about the willingness to take the risks of addressing the felt needs of the time. Were the lawyers in the past who had transformative impact always right? No. Did they always succeed? No. Did they have important lives trying to lead on big issues? Yes. Thank you very much for listening. Um, in whatever, I think we have a few minutes, and I would absolutely love uh, to have a discussion, answer any questions, um, if, uh, if someone has the courage to start. <laughs> yeah. One of our professors in uh, first year class said that law is unique, that the profession is unique, and that it's the only profession where you're taught not to explain your creativity. You don't do visible work. You do what others have done for you. the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission in the, you know, sort of last third of the 19th century. I mean, it was the beginning of the mixed economy. Look what's happened to the structure of American law uh, since that time. I mean, as I was trying to say before, we spend a lot of time parsing out the interstitial rules in the securities laws or the antitrust laws. But sometimes they're just not right for the time. You need to either create a new framework, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, civil rights laws, um, you know, or change an existing framework. 
So I, I think you know, the, I find this distinction really between public policy schools and law schools to be somewhat artificial because broad public policy, the, the broad legislative frameworks, the positive law uh, that we basically deal with in a mixed economy is going to be created by you. Um, and it asks the broad problems and it questions and it basically says, there's no precedent here. I mean, the question is, should or should not the state intervene? Should the government intervene? Maybe we should deregulate. Maybe we should regulate. But it, it is asking a, a set of questions to deal with existing problems where there may be analogies. And it's not like that you're mindless and you come to it and invent something brand new. There are plenty of analogies and historical things you can look at. But it, there are new problems that aren't answered by past precedent. I don't know if that responds to you. Yeah. Just uh, from your speech, it seems that you quite emphasize on the uh, joint degree and also interdisciplinary study. However, my feeling is, generally speaking, people only spend three years in the law school. The time is so short, and there is so many things to study. So actually, <laughs> I think there is kind of trade-off. It's a bad, you know, it's better to be a leadership when people know everything of something or know something of everything. You know, if you do a joint degree uh, in three years, you probably will end up know everything of uh, something of everything. But if I really concentrate, uh, say, in constitutional or in civil procedure in the three years, maybe I'll become an expert. Okay, I, I think this goes to the fundamental question of what professional schools are about. And I don't think that, I personally don't think that professional schools are about mastering fields of knowledge. <coughs> They're mastering ways of thinking about problems. You'll go out, you'll take the bar if you want to be a tax lawyer, you want to be a securities lawyer, you want to be an antitrust lawyer, you will master the law in the course of practice. Taking an antitrust course and then taking antitrust two, you know, you could, rather than taking antitrust two, you could take um, corporate finance or marketing or something else. So my argument is that these schools, the time that you're here, you should be acquiring the broadest set of skills that you can to give you the broadest vision because it's, they're not about knowledge. I mean, you, sure, you learn things along the way. But you, look, everybody knows, you've talked to your friends, when you go take the stupid bar exam, you have to start again. You know, you, you, you have to cram for the bar exam. Your law school courses won't do you much good, I guarantee it. You know, you gotta do the damn book. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I think if you think about, about professional school as, as, as skill acquisition as opposed to knowledge acquisition, that's the answer to your question. Yeah. In light of how both, or well, all law, business, public policy schools have an increased focus on moving students in cohorts there where you have your small section at the law school or in the public policy school here and at the business school as well they do all of the classes together with the same small group of students um, and that there's ac academic pedagogical networking <coughs> benefits to that but the problem with the joint degree then is that you're split apart from your cohort and even if you and if you don't take like the year away at the other school then you're not a part of either cohort. And I wonder how you would reconcile that desire to, to move the students together and build those relationships with the desire to have increased. I think, I think the answer is that the, the sort of section is first year. In other words, it, 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 in your first year, and you're always, in, if you have a joint degree, you're going to basically take the first year in, in some school, business, public policy, law, whatever it is, and there you do get that experience, that you're going to be in the 90-person section of the Harvard Business School. I don't know what the size of the groups are. There's 90-person sections at Harvard Law School. I don't know what they are here. But you'll have that experience in your first year. But in most of these professional schools, second, third year, or second year, you know, at the business schools, they go off and take a million different courses. So I think the answer is you have that experience first year, and you then diversify in second and third year. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, so you're talking about condensing what is now a four-year program. Into three into years. Into a three-year program. Right. But you the still get the first year. Now is that you take the first year in both schools, so you, that's two years, and then you have another two years where you do like the electives. <coughs> so are you saying that in three years you would still do one L in the first year at the business school, and then just have one year of like, elective classes? Maybe I haven't, I haven't thought that through. I mean, I think if you started in the law school, you know, you you you, you might then be able to do the joint MBA. Uh, you know, if you had that cohort experience, if you had that intense experience the first year, then you might be able to mix and match a little more. You wouldn't necessarily have to take the, the total first year business school course if you were doing the joint degree, because you're going to obviously have to you know, shorten both. Uh, you're not going to do the full two-year MBA and the full three-year JD, because that's five years. Um, so there's going to be some trimming when you, when you figure out. But I, I do believe, in terms of what you're learning, uh, you can get 
these important perspectives in three years and then go out and be in the real world. I mean, you know, the way you learn uh, fundamentally is to practice, is to, is to have mentors, have real problems, and be accountable. Yeah. I, I'm so curious, to what extent do you think the fact that like law schools and I, I suspect business schools are such cash cows for universities sort of creates a lot of, I guess, you know, um, resistance to the idea of condensing the program? Do you, like you, you find, I mean, I guess the, the schools with which you're most familiar have, you know, no shortage of, of funds, so it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not, you, you, I wonder, wonder if you encounter kind of that kind of resistance, or do you think it's sort of? I, I think th there's no question that there is sort of, you'd have to work out the economics. But as you say, I'm, I'm talking for this, to pilot this set of problems and programs, I'm talking about the top 20 law schools <coughs> at the beginning. Most of these schools have got, you know, a fair amount of, of money. Uh, not, they're not overly rich, some of them. So I think you can work through, I think you can work through the economics if there is a will. If, I mean, part of this is about what is professional education about? If there's a commitment to the vision, you know, then you figure out how to do the money. And uh, honestly, I really believe that. I, I think you have to, I mean, I think what's lacking is the commitment to the vision. If you have the commitment to the vision, you'll figure out how to do the economics. You yeah. Besides the willingness to take risks in terms of working with some non-traditional careers, is one of the obstacles to, uh, to achieving that goal our applicant pool? I don't mean that by something any of our wonderful students. I you know, count myself in that. And in general, folks applying for this fine school and other similar schools are not risk averse. In fact, they are, they are or rather they are tremendously risk averse. They are choosing. They are not entrepreneurial. They are necessarily looking for what has traditionally been a very sort of consistent and safe and secure path. And perhaps our lives on standardized tests or I agree, I agree with all that. And I think I think one interesting question is whether the law schools should require some kind of experience. I mean, I don't know what the precise numbers are, but you know, traditionally the business schools have said be out three or four years, get life experience, and come to the business school. They're bringing that back a little bit because some of the people who go out to the real world never come back because they're making two million dollars. <laughs> but um, but the business schools are coming back a little bit. But the question is whether the law schools should say take a break between you know college and law school, go out and live, do something. I mean, and then and when you see what happens in the real world, then you have a much better appreciation of people have to make decisions, make take risks, whether it's sort of you know political risk or policy risk or business risk or whatever it is. So I think there'd be some advantage, number one, to doing that. Number two, I think one of the problems with everybody in this room um, is, and you know, I'm just like you, is that you know, we were all highly successful in high school and college. You want to be in law school. And that, that success, in a funny kind of way, can imprison you. It can say, God, I'm, I'm, I've been a success. Everybody's viewed me as success. Uh, success, I'm afraid that I might fail. Uh, and I, so I think, ironically, the success also has with it this sort of hidden fear of failure. And, and you kind of have to get over that. You have to sort of say to yourself, what's life about? I mean, you know, it's not about getting in another grade, you know, a nice GPA or something like that. It's about doing something. It's about changing the world. It's about helping people, whatever it is. You know, you've got to kind of get out of the student mindset. And, you know, that means following your heart as much as your head and really trying to do something you care about. Um, and that may involve uh, taking some risks. So I, I, would, I would think about having that division. I, would, I think people need to confront candidly. Being successful academically may make them more conservative because they've been you know, golden students. Their parents love them. All their parents' friends say you're great. You know, OK, like, you know, get on with life. So for upper level courses, if the idea is to acquire a great diversity of skill sets instead of a great diversity of knowledge base, what areas of law do you think <coughs> in combination give a, a very diverse set of skills that wouldn't be found in any one area of law? What kind of legal skills or what kind of, I mean, I've tried to indicate that sort of, you know, I think having an appreciation of how business people look at problems, how government, high governmental uh, decision makers look at problems, it's more that different set of perspectives. And then to the extent that you have particular interests, all the, uh, uh, the, the academic disciplines, uh, you mix and match. I, you know, I can't, I can't answer the question because it depends on what your interests are. I just am saying that the, the still the fundamental emphasis in law school on case-based training and reasoning from cases um, just has to, we have to break that. I mean, we're, it's being done. It's, I don't want to make it sound like the school's monolithic, but we just have to bust it, o bust it open more, more than we have. It's hard, it's really hard to answer. I'm okay, I can keep going as long as they want. All right. Yeah, we're, if there are more, I'm happy to keep going for a few minutes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, it seems to me that your statement that we uh, need to create uh, more law students who are leaders is, 
akin to saying that we need to uh, to make more law students who are Olympic athletes because uh, uh, being a leader is to some extent God's gift. You cannot, you know, uh, teach everyone to be a leader, and especially <coughs> considering um, uh, the selection process into law school, it's very uh, unlikely that people with leadership uh, uh, qualities would make it to a, a law school because you do not become a leader by reading books and you know uh, staying all, all your life in the library it just you know doesn't happen uh, <coughs> I agree with you and all I'm saying is that, that law students ought to aspire to lead that the, the prevailing legal culture is to say what's legal or not legal and maybe to counsel the prevailing legal culture is not to train as the business schools and the public policy do to train people to aspire aspire not to become to aspire to leadership and to ha give them the skills and the breadth of vision so that they can be leaders no there's of course no guarantee and but you know aspiring to it putting yourself in positions having different career moves um, you know creates the possibility you all, and it's impossible for you to believe, but you're all going to become my age and, you know, <laughs> and at some point. And my generation, for better or for worse, you know, we, we led the world for a while, and then we move on. And you know, in 30 years, you'll be leading the world. So, and there's no reason why the people sitting in this room shouldn't be those leaders. I mean, there's just the inevitable march of generations. So all I'm suggesting is aspire, when that time comes, to be there and have the breadth of vision to po have the possibility. Uh, but I agree with you, it's not, no, no way it's a guarantee. Thank you. Okay.